Hello, and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Karen Snape with Virginia Cooperative Extension, and I have with me today my friend and colleague, Dr. Carolyn Copenhaver, a faculty member in Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation at Virginia Tech. And today we're going to talk to you about tree-related microhabitats. So let's head into the woods and find out more about that. So Carolyn, can you tell us what a tree-related microhabitat is? Sure, so when we think of a tree, we tend to think of this as being a scarlet oak, that's one species. But when you start looking into the small crooks and crannies of it, you'll see that it's actually a habitat for a lot of different species. So just right here on the surface, we've got a lichen here, we've got a moss here, we have a different type of lichen. So there's three species just growing on top of this small area within the big tree. And so microhabitats are small features on trees that allow other species to live. And therefore, they're an indication of the biodiversity of a forest. The more microhabitats you have, the higher the diversity of that forest. So different scientists have come up with different ways of categorizing and counting these microhabitats. We're gonna be using this guide put out by the European Forest Institute. A lot of this work's been done in Europe, and I'm gonna put this, a link to this document in the links to this video so that you can follow along and use it in your own woodland. Uh, you might notice that it is in British English uh, because it's written for a European audience. Don't let that stop you. Just put on your trousers, your jumper, maybe your wellies, and get out there and hit the woods. So a few months ago, um, Dr. Copenhaver did a program on this for my Master Naturalist chapter. She also does this with her students. And I reached out to her and I said, hey, I think that the forest landowners would really like this um, because this gives you something that you can do in your woods to um, learn more about your forest, learn more about the types of habitats that you might have in your forest, what parts of your forest might be richer in habitats than other parts. And um, this is something that you can even do as a family where you could go out and look for these, you can count them. But you can be as, as general or as specific as you want. So uh, they've got tons and tons of different ones that they categorize as cavities. For example, this is a cavity without ground contact. And uh, even within cavity without ground contact, the resource I give you is gonna talk about, you know, different size categories. But you can just say cavity, or you can say cavity with ground contact, cavity without. I also think that, you know, so often I've helped uh, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, 4-H, um, looking at habitats. And a lot of times you'll get kids that are either like, the forest is the habitat. Or you'll get kids who are very focused on finding that dead hollow tree that they are convinced a bear lives in. And so this gives you sort of something more concrete to, you know, sort of focus on and, and um, direct your effort towards finding these specific things that you may not have even considered before. So there's a few things you might want to take with you besides just your usual woods walking kit. Um, of course, your guide, or maybe you make some uh, kind of a simplified version of this, uh, depending on how much detail you want to go into, if you're doing it with kids or whatever, but bring some kind of a guide. Um, you'll want a ruler that has centimeters in it because again, European. Another thing you can do instead of a ruler or in addition to a ruler is you can make yourself a little template. So this little template I made just out of cardstock, it's five centimeters in one direction and 10 centimeters in the other direction. So that's a quick, easy way to measure, you know, is this more than five, is this more than 10? Another thing you might want is a pair of binoculars, just for looking for nests, cavities, damage, higher up in the trees than you can comfortably see. Here we have um, an example of um, epiphytes. So epi, epi just means kind of on the top or the surface of, and phyte means plants, but in this case, we're using it to describe actually fungus, mushrooms. That's pretty common to see people group those together. And so these are the fruiting bodies of mushrooms. Um, you might call these shelf fungus. Uh, you might be familiar with um, turkey tail and false turkey tail and some of the other um, specific ones. But these are growing on the tree. 
And so right away we know that the tree is a habitat for funguses. In this case, it's actually a dead tree. So some of uh, the things that we're looking for, we're only looking for on live trees, but this is one of the ones that even if it's on a dead tree, it is still a habitat. And this is a habitat for the fungus. And then the fungus also is creating a tiny microhabitat as well. So if you look in at some of these, there's a few of these where you can see that underneath there's a little bit more green, a little bit more um, plant growth underneath. And that's because that is creating a little microhabitat. It's a little bit sheltered. It's a little bit damper down there. And so that's a microhabitat caused by the epiphytes that are growing on the larger habitat of the tree. All right, so what we've got right here is a root buttress cavity, which is part of a growth form microhabitat. And it's actually formed from the buttressing of the roots and it goes down into the tree. You can see me reaching my hand down inside there. And this, remember, microhabitats means habitat. So there's things that are living inside that feature. And in this case, you can actually see we've got nibbled up old acorn shells. So somebody's been hiding in here and using this as a shelter. And remember, it's all connecting to biodiversity. So the more habitats you have, the higher your biodiversity in the forest. So here on this small tree, we actually have two uh, different microhabitats. So one of them is the epiphytic bryophytes, which just means mosses and things like that growing on the tree, a large patch of it. And one of the reasons that that's able to grow here is actually because of this other one. This is called a dendrotelm. This is a cavity in the tree pointing upwards, cup-shaped. And you can see how this retains moisture. There's a little bit of snow down in there from the precipitation we had earlier this morning. And there's a lot of mosses that are able to grow in there and around there because this area is gonna stay moist well past when everything else around here dries out. And you can see actually that this actually holds water. We're, we're pouring some water in there. There you go, yep. It holds water, making this a cavity called a dendrotelm. And again, that epiphytic bryophyte microhabitat on the outside. So here we have another cavity type of microhabitat. A lot of the microhabitats that we've been looking at are really good habitat for plants or insects or fungi, um, small living things that don't immediately come to mind maybe when you think about animals and habitats. Um, but this type, this is a cavity that has ground contact. If you're following along on the sheets, you'll see they talk about mold. That's just European talk for having rot. And you can see this is a cavity that's rotted out of this tree. And you can see here that this is something that's being used by probably small mammals. You can see here's a acorn and other remains of little snacks and things that the critter has sheltered in here to eat. This is clearly there's a lot of this debris, this material here. So this is a cavity that's been used a lot. Here is something that some of you might recognize if you had a timber harvest uh, or any other reason that you might have had heavy equipment working in your woods or maybe on a, a tree at a, at a home site, you'll also see damage like this. Now, of course, from a timber standpoint, this is, uh, this is a bad thing, right? This is going to, um, you know, cause a reduction in growth and value of your timber. But from a habitat standpoint, this is actually um, what we call an, an injury habitat, injury microhabitat, where you've actually created, exposed this sapwood and created some different habitats um, uh, in these different areas where this tree has been damaged. So this is a microhabitat that you might have um, and so that something at least comes out of having an injured tree. I've got in front of me a microhabitat called a splintered stem. This is actually under the injuries category. 
Many of you may have had your woods harvested and you know what a cut stump looks like, nice and flat. When it happens in nature and you get an injury like this, it creates a lot more habitat surface and diversity. So you get these long splintered areas that can support insects, fungi, moss, lichens, all sorts of habitat that can go into these splintered stems. All right, so here we have another type of cavity. This is a woodpecker flute. A woodpecker flute is at least three cavities either connected or within a meter of each other or a yard of each other. You can see we've got four here. There's actually another little one on the side you probably can't see. So this is a woodpecker flute. So I think a lot of people would look at this and recognize this as habitat for a woodpecker. Um, but a lot of other insects and things will use this type of habitat as well. So keep an eye out for these. Here we have an example of a resin flow, uh, resin, you know, being sap on a conifer tree. So this, if you're keeping track, this is under other on the last page, and it says a significant flap sap flow from a conifer species. And so it says at least 50 centimeters. You can see my handy smoky bear ruler here. This is uh, 30 centimeters. You can see it's a, oh, at least twice that goes all the way down to the ground. So. Um, sap or resin will flow from a conifer tree when it's been injured. And you can see there's some injuries here, some holes, uh, maybe made by woodpecker or um, insect damage or forestry students. And um, so it has the injury here and then it has the sap flow and that sap um, can be a food source for different kinds of insects um, might feed on that. So this is one of our microhabitats here, this resin flow at least 50 centimeters on a conifer. Thank you for joining us for this week's 15 Minutes in the Forest. Please come back in two more weeks for another topic.